it in the chat as well. We're going to get uh, to questions at the end of the program, but we welcome them all throughout. <clears throat> Below the screen is a list of web resources uh, that relate to this afternoon's program. So feel free to take a look at those now uh, or uh, later. Uh, and lastly, this program is being recorded. Uh, so if you need to duck out early, want to watch it again, or want to share with a friend, the dramatic monologue, That Which Can Be Held. Uh, in a few minutes, Eric is going to premiere this mini play, which is really exciting. Um, Eric, it's wonderful to have you with us uh, this afternoon. Thank you. It's delightful to be here. I'm excited. Uh, and the photos that inspired Eric's monologue were selected by CMA's curator of photography, Barbara Tannenbaum, for her stories from storage episode, Paper Airplanes. Uh, we're really lucky to have Barbara with us this afternoon uh, to tell us a little bit more about that exhibition um, and engage with, uh, in conversation with Eric as well. Uh, welcome, Barbara. Thank you so much. It's fabulous to be here. So, um, <clears throat> Barbara, before Eric's monologue, I, I wanted, I and I'm sure our audience want to know a little bit more about the idea behind your Storage from Storage episode, Paper Airplanes. Uh, what inspired you to develop this uh, idea for this sort of mini exhibition and select the objects that are on the uh, checklist? Well, like most of us, I've been sticking close to home during COVID and I really miss traveling. And so I turned to photographs to satisfy my wanderlust. These flat pieces of paper allow us to travel, not just through space, but also through time, which is really cool. And so I called my section of stories from storage, Paper Airplanes. And it contains 15 photographs that take us from New York, from Egypt in 1857 to New York Harbor in 1998. Now, even before the advent of the cell phone selfie, travel had become as much about documenting your presence at the site as about directly experiencing it. Lee Friedlander points this out in his depiction of a couple looking at Mount Rushmore, but they're looking through lenses, the lenses of a binocular and a camera. If you don't have a photo of it, how are you gonna know you were really there? In the mid 19th century, when photography was invented, it offered a novel experience you could be an armchair tourist. A man or a woman in Boston could see Yosemite without having to spend four months on a wagon train to California. And thanks to Carlton Watkins' photograph, we can see it now in 2021 as it was in 1865, before there were roads, visitor centers, parking lots, and yes, trash cans. Carlos Naya's photograph of St. Mark's Square in Venice in the moonlight is so romantic, but Naya actually took that photograph in the daytime. And it's not <clears throat> the moon that we're looking at, it's the sun. He made it look like the night in the dark room. We know that because um, the painted lamps, for instance, the lamps that are all lit were painted in, and we can look carefully when you go to the show, please do this, he missed one. Artist photographs of tourist meccas always look better than my photographs, for sure, but sometimes it's because they are idealizing rather than documenting. These photographs offer us the fantasy and the romance of travel without its travails. In choosing a vantage point and framing a scene, the photographer edits reality. And now, thanks to digital manipulation, the photographer can transform reality as Adam Foose transformed the Taj Mahal in this enormous photograph. It's a daguerreotype, one of the first forms of photography, and to distract himself from the sorrow of a romantic breakup, Foose challenged himself to make the world's largest daguerreotype. Now, the Taj Mahal is a world famous monument to lost love, so it seemed to him an appropriate subject. But instead of going to India, Foos took an 1864 negative of the site, which you see below in this image, and corrected it in Photoshop to evoke the perfect symmetry and harmony of the Taj. All the works in paper airplanes suggest balance, dreamy calm, and classical beauty. They invite us on a journey, not of the body, but of the mind and the imagination. And I'm <clears throat> delighted that they provided inspiration for the imagination of playwright Eric Koval. Awesome. 
Thanks so much, Barbara, for that introduction. I think it's uh, it's really interesting how um, you know photography is really built into certain ideas of travel from the onset of photography. It's sort of you know kind of part of the experience, and I really get that sense from your show. Um, and thank you for also mentioning imagination, right? Um, uh, because now we're going to see the product <laughs> of, of imagination. Um, we have the premiere of Eric Kobel's monologue, which is titled That Which Can Be Held, uh, which was inspired by photographs in the CA, CMA collection that are on view in paper airplanes. During the monologue, you'll see some of these photographs um, appear. Um, so I will leave it to you, Eric. I don't know why I thought I was going to have to move the bed. I mean, I do know why. It was it was because I needed a cave, uh, uh, an enclosure, a, a a a womb that would hold me on all sides so that I could barely breathe. Cause that worked when I was little. Um, pretty early on, I figured out that I couldn't actually stop my mom and dad, but uh, I, I could go into my bedroom. The door closed on my bedroom. I could sit on my bed with my knees tucked in just as small as I could make myself. But even then they could still get me. I mean, their, their voices, the, the tidal wave coming off of them, that could still get me. So I just moved. You know, I don't think I was even, I didn't even think about it. It was totally unconscious. I, I just knew where I had to go. I had to pull my bed away from the wall and crawl into that narrow space between wall and bed. Something about being in that little valley. You know, I wasn't under the bed. I was still being a big boy. I was facing the world. I just, I needed the world to be smaller. And just me, bunched up, hands around legs, head down in my little trench. So then naturally when all of this happened, my first thought, or it wasn't even a thought, it was an impulse, like a gut instinct, was to get to the bed, to move the bed, to find my cave again. But obviously the bed is not an option this time. Um, not even always to sleep on, much less to move just so I could. But the couch worked great. I could pull the couch away from the living room wall and wedge myself between the couch and the wall and get held, you know, tight, tight, tight. And of course, the first time I did that, I remembered the pictures. My grandmother gave me the pictures. Um, we went to my grandma's house when I was little. She lived far away. It was a big deal to go there. We only went once while she was alive, but I still, I was still a kid and there was this part of me that believed, like really believed, like, like when you go over hope over and over and over again so much that it hardens into reality. Like I believed that being at my grandmother's would somehow change my mom and dad, that would open their eyes or their hearts or whatever was closed, whatever it was that kept catching fire. And for that summer, just for that summer at least, we would be good. Except, of course, the kind of hope that a kid turns into belief isn't strong enough or not strong enough to withstand adults. So when my mom and dad inevitably turned my grandma's house into the same scorched earth that they turned our own house into, I found myself in my grandmother's room wedged between her bed and her wall, hoping, hoping, hoping not to get hit with any shrapnel. But my grandmother... Uh, she came into her room this one afternoon while they were going at it. She probably needed an escape herself. And she saw me down there on her floor in my tight little ball beside her bed. And I remember looking up at her. I don't know what was in my eyes or what she saw there, but I remember her watching me. And then she stepped over to her dresser and she took out this little envelope. And she got down on the floor, like this creaking old woman. She sat down on the floor and she scooched in beside me and she showed me her photographs. Or, I mean, it wasn't not her photograph. She didn't take them, but they were these, these small prints, like, like postcard size, these, these old black and white photos that she loved as a young woman. And she showed me one and she told me quietly, quietly, her lips like right beside my ear, so close enough to block out the explosions coming from the other room. She told me about the photo. And then the next one, and the next one, the two of us together just curled up between her bed and her wall. 
And for a few minutes, I was okay. I was okay. And when summer ended and it was time to go back to the trenches, as my dad said, no idea how right he was, my grandmother pulled me aside as I was about to get in, climb into the back seat of our car. And she handed me this little envelope. Hold on to these, she said. Hold on to them. You hear me? So naturally, now with everything, I pulled those photos out again. And I moved the couch, and I crawled into my little cave. And um, this is the first one. It's Mexico. That's an ancient Mayan temple. I've never been to Mexico. I've, I've never been anywhere. Emily and me were saving up to go to Disney World, but I mean, this, this, this is a whole other planet. I mean, what I love about it is that it's there, you know? Like people spent years and years building something and it is there. You can, you can see the forest climbing up, nature doing its nature thing, you know? I mean, it's not evil. This reminds me of that too. Nature's not evil. Nature's nature is just to grow, to keep growing whether we want it to or not. But this... It's possible to build a thing that even nature in a thousand years can't take down. Sometimes I want to believe that's because it was built with faith. I mean, not like a little kid's hope, but faith. Faith that the gods wanted it done. Maybe that kind of faith can't be torn down. I think that's why I spent so much time looking at this one back at the beginning when the shit first hit the fan to remind myself. I mean, this took care and planning, right? I mean, you look, look at those straight lines, those right angles, man, those stairs. They knew if you wanted to get close to heaven, you had to build a serious staircase and build it right. And maybe even more than that, you had to have will. Not only the planners, but the slaves tearing their muscles and crushing bones for every inch they moved a boulder. And even the slave drivers willing to grind apart other human beings, the earth itself, all to make something that lasts. What kind of willpower does that take? What kind of stamina? So much that even nature can't take it apart. And I love that there is so much I don't know about this and that that's okay. You know, there's so much mystery, how it happened, why it happened, how to even relate to this gigantic thing in the middle of your life, but you don't have to have the answers. It can just sit there silently, Every crevice filled with secrets and fears and prayers and blood and that no one will ever know. And the other thing that I love, I didn't know this when I was little, but I love that as huge as this pyramid is, and not just the pyramid, which has got to be like 10 city blocks square, right? But this world that it came out of, the whole Mayan empire, all those people, all those lives, the, the universe they believed in, the gods that they prayed to, that entire thing can fit in my hand. When I hold these photos, I can hold the whole world just for a minute. It's suddenly a size that I can understand. This, this world, I can literally control. They took control of their world, I will take control of mine. Um, but then after a while, I, I really started looking at this one. It's Canyon de Chez out in Arizona. Uh, again, I haven't been there. Um, I think I love this one because there's people. Even in this huge, vast land that utterly dwarfs them, there's still people. And they belong there. I mean, the, the rocks and the sand and the sky, they're huge. They're forever. And the people are just passing through, literally. But the people have just as much right to be there as anything else. They're part of nature, too, not some foreign bodies to be eaten alive by it. People and horses joined together in 20th century centaurs treading quietly over the earth. And this isn't like the Mayan temple. There, there's not this will to dominate the world. These people and their dog, they have a dog. I love that they have a dog. They, they aren't dominating anything. They're just passing through. And that's okay. You know, sometimes in the middle of the night, I think maybe they're looking for water. I think I hear them calling out for water. But mostly I think they're just on their way home on their way home and so calm. Even in this world that could absolutely crush them, 
but they know it so well that they don't even have to be on guard. It's just one step after another, after another, no chance of getting lost, which uh, let me say, I would love. <laughs> but I do wonder, because they've been through this canyon so often and beaten the dust into hard pack under their, their horses' hooves, I wonder if they even notice it anymore surrounded by astonishment, by the, the work of millions of years of trickling streams and the, the remains of mountains and oceans of gods? Do they even see it anymore? And maybe just as important, does the astonishment see them anymore? Do the sky and the stone and the faces of God even know they exist? When you're that small, that temporary, do you even mean anything? Is building a giant pyramid the only way to say, hey, we were here, for a few minutes, we mattered, but regardless, things don't stop, right? They never stop. Sometimes they just get worse, and I didn't, and that's when I should have found a happy picture. I know that, an uplifting picture, but what I wanted, um, what some part of me wanted or, or needed uh, was this. I found myself staring at it for hours. Like the sun would come up and I would hear the alarm going off in our bedroom and I would still be staring at this, Egypt. This is what it felt like. I'd like, sure, you can build something bigger than yourself, solid, beautiful, it's real, you can touch it, the world can touch it, but it's still, you can only defy gravity for so many centuries. Make all the damn pyramids out of stone you want, it will still come to this. Either someone will come along as intent on destroying as you were on creating and lay waste to everything you've done, or it will just collapse under its own weight. But even then, even if it's in ruins, that doesn't mean that stone was carved, you know? It was shaped and smoothed and dreamed by human hands, by human minds to honor death to be the watchers between worlds, to show that beauty and grace can continue, can persevere. So then I think, yeah, okay, so what? Even if it's a doomed attempt, great. The attempt is all we've got. Why shouldn't we pour everything we have into fighting off fate and make something as close to perfect as we humanly can? Even knowing, yes, absolutely, they're doomed. We're doomed. It's all gonna be ruins for someone else to climb over because I can't help thinking it. Everyone who had a hand in creating this is long gone. I mean, and more than that, these people, the ones in the photo with their donkeys and camels, these, these scavengers so busy being so alive, surrounded by death, you know, they're all gone too. And the person who took this photo, every single being involved in every single one of these photos is no longer on this planet. And pretty soon we won't be either. And then I wonder, assuming that nature just took its course, when they fell, when the guardians fell, if there was anyone there to bear witness, to hear the crack, 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 and the boulder scraping on boulder, that eternal moment of silence as the mountain fell through space, and then the dull thud in the earth as the gods impacted. Or did it happen in the dark, alone? when the only possible witness was curled up hiding behind a couch. And either way, then these new people show up, these tiny new people, look at them. I mean, they can't even be bothered to bring a dog. Gnats on the shoulders of deities, they're, and they're there for what? I mean, they're not even on their way home. They're not looking for water. They're purely there to survey the damage, to say, oh my goodness, imagine what this must have been once. Can you imagine? I can only imagine. I'm so sorry. It must be so hard. Is there anything I can do? Is there anything you can do? Look around you. Look at these giants, these, these guardians, these things made of freaking rock, their heads smashed into dust beside you. Is there anything I can do? Is there anything I can do? You can mourn. You can see the future and climb into a crevice between a couch and a wall, and you can stare at a hundred-year-old photograph, and you can stare. That's what you can do. Uh, and then sometimes I need this. I need the stillness. I need the, the frozen. I need the idea. I don't care if it's wrong. I need the idea that things can last, that beauty will last. Sometimes you can even stop the sun as it's rising. 
there's a coldness in this picture. It's Alaska. It's like even the sunlight is cold. And sometimes that feels so good to be so cold that you can't feel like my, 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 my molecules themselves are slowing down, cooling down, everything's settling down. The water is still, the trees are still, the house is still, Emily's still, I'm still. Like if I even breathe, I'll shatter it. I'll take us back to Egypt, back to collapse. I said, look at that. I mean, that mountain's not going anywhere. It's the, the Mayan temple without the right angles. No forest is even attempting to eat it away. There are trees there down below, thousands of trees probably, but they're all in shadow, frozen. And the water just reflects sky, heaven. The water is so, so pure. No poisons in it. No doubt, no something in your scans. Nothing but smooth, still clarity. Except I will say this, sometimes when I'm staring, the mountain starts to look like crumpled paper, don't they? They look, and if I'm being honest, they look exactly like the mountain range of papers that I have crumpled on our dining table, and which was immature. I apologize to the ancient majestic mountain for comparing it to a pile of medical bills and insurance notifications. But sometimes, you know, after two and a half hours on the phone, you don't feel much like frozen sunlight. You know, you just crush every single piece of paper that comes to hand and you make your own mountain range and you leave it sitting there on your dining room table. Maybe mountains are nothing but God's waste paper thrown all over his dining room table but his are prettier, serene. That's the word, serenity, surrenderity, which uh, leads me to this one. This was the last one my grandmother showed me. This is the one that I've been looking at the most lately, the most tonight. My grandmother told me that it's California, but I like to think that it's the Sahara Desert. It's also rolling waves on the Atlantic Ocean, which Emily and I did get to. That was our one trip. We did get to the beach to see ocean waves rolling in while we held each other in moonlight. And it's also flesh, Emily's arm and her waist, her hips, her legs, all the parts of her body that I want to caress as she lies in our bed, except that touching her now causes her to flinch in pain. But here in this photo, I can still run my fingers along her outline, rolling smooth skin in moonlight. And it's also the folds of the blanket covering her as she sits in the chemo couch at the hospital. I spent hours, days, watching that blanket rise and fall with her shallow breath, the quiet tick of the monitors, the padded footfalls of her nurses giving hopeful smiles. But here in this photo, everything's still and beautiful. Except it isn't still. That's the other thing that I like is that it's totally permanent and all totally disappearing at the same time. Somehow that seems even more true than the pyramid or the statues or even the mountain. These dunes, the ones in this picture, they were gone before the photographer could even develop the film. But the sand, the sand of these dunes, it's still there right now. And it'll be there way after I'm gone and Emily's gone and everyone we know is gone. Still beautiful. But never again like it is at this moment. Because that's the other thing I love. I love that there are people there. I mean, not, not in the picture frame, but in the Sahara nomads who cross the entire desert over a thousand miles of this nothing but sand and they don't get lost they have even less landmarks than the people crossing canyon to shea even their footprints disappearing behind them the, the desert that they walk into or the desert they walk out of is not the same one they walked into but they make it they trust and they watch the sun and the stars and they follow whatever animal instinct says this way keep going Keep going, keep going. And they take one step and another and another and another. And they get there, they cross the impossible. And 
as I sit here, crunched on the floor, listening to Emily's sleeping breaths in the bedroom, blending with the, my grandmother's whispers in my ear, feeling small, so small, so fragile, knowing that nothing we build will last, that nature is always, always moving to take us apart from without and within. But this world, these worlds, I can hold. This moment, as huge as the universe itself, I can hold. Thank you. <laughs> wow. Virtual applause. Thank you, Eric. That was really incredible. Um, Folks out there, uh, feel free to pop whatever comments you'd like into the chat and questions as well. Um, it's really amazing, Eric, how you were able to bring, I think, just, just to string together these disparate photographs, just like Barbara has, but kind of kind of uh, stitch together a different kind of story through them, right? It's really quite, quite beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, so Eric, just to, just to, while questions are coming in, I already kind of see things, activity happening, which is exciting. Um, I know that you, um, you know, all the, all these sort of storytellers that we invited to do this, uh, this special series of desktop dialogues were sort of given free reign of the checklist. Um, and uh, the images from Barbara's photographs were, sorry, the, the, the Barbara's photographs were kind of very near the top for you. Um, uh, what attracted you to uh, to this sort of uh, mini exhibition and to these images? Well, I mean, first, the images are just so striking. You know, they just leap out at you uh, when you see them. And um, then I began, I thought about the idea of the paper airplanes, of, of the idea of escape and thinking, like, what kind of things do we want to escape from? And um, and then I, and I began to and think about, like, this: if, if someone is going through this incredibly hard time, uh, and what does it mean to try to get away when you can't leave, when you have to be, uh, you cannot leave your situation, but you want to, but you have to leave. You have to escape for some minutes or hours every day. Um, and then I got the idea of this, of what if, 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 you know, you can't get to a museum, but maybe you have these little photographs. And then this idea of, 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 of a world made small, that even, even when they're the full-size photographs in the museum, where they're big pictures, they're still so much smaller than what they represent. And then if they get smaller still to where they're human, human sized and can fit in your palm of your hand. And what does that do to your relationship to the world? To this huge vastness around you um, shown over and over in these images that then somehow maybe you can you can navigate in a very small human way. And um, and that that began then a storyline began to roll out of that. And then I began to choose pictures that would help um, tell stories to me about permanence and impermanence and um, and willpower and 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 the desire to keep going and the desire to let go and things like that. Um, Barbara, as as the curator of this you know mini exhibition and as a photo historian, um, uh, what did Eric's monologue draw out for you about these photographs? Uh, since you know them, I think from a, you know very from as a as a historian, um, you know focused on material culture, artistic you know um, st stylistic interests and things like that. What what did you see in them? Uh, did you see anything anew? Throughout? Yeah, very much. I mean, they really made me. I mean, I thought about them in relation to my personal situation when I chose them because feeling hamstrung by COVID and not being able to go out. But, um, but Eric, I mean, your, your play just really put them into a so much more personal context. Um, and it made me realize that for each individual person who comes in, how impacted they could be by the circumstances of their life and how they might react differently to the photographs, um, even at different times in their lives. So that sort of personalization and individualization is something that I usually sort of pull back from as a curator to try to be more objective mm. and more historical. And, and this just really was a lot, you know, a, a luxury to be able to really immerse myself in it. Right. Um, Barbara, you have a, do you have a, a, a question for Eric before we turn to the audience? Sure. sure. I mean, I love the juxtaposition of scale that you just talked about again about, you know, small versus the large world. 
Um, and I'm wondering, besides that just sort of juxtaposition of scale, um, how was it different to go and see them in person? Because I know you worked both from images on the computer before the show was open, and then you got to go see them in person. And of course, I'm hoping everybody will do that. But how was it different to see them in person? Did that change your response to them? It did. It does because it, it's um, there, there's just there's a, 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 the same as any piece of art in a museum or a gallery that that um, that ability to move in three dimensions with it that is is sort of doable on a computer, but just not the same. Like I can have the image of the computer image of of the Mayan temple here on. Uh, on my computer screen and I can get closer to it and really look at it and back up a little bit. But when you're in the museum, you can get like 10 feet away from it. And it's a totally different experience than if you're one inch away from it, what you're seeing and how, what, how it's washing over you and washing into you. So that ability to move uh, with, with the photographs um, and because they're so large that you can really feel that change. And then the other thing that surprised me, frankly, the most was um, that I just assumed they would all be on flat paper, right? That they'd be photographs, map photographs and um and the fact that some of them are printed on uh on textured paper um and suddenly that becomes a different thing too especially as you get closer to it you see this very still or, or this very transient moment like a moment in time that isn't it doesn't even exist anymore put on this thing to hold it like to physically hold it in place and that has its own texture as well as the image um that surprised me how that began to influence me a little bit sometimes in some of the photos. Yeah, and the Fustigarotype really are so transient that if you look at them from one angle, you get this wonderful rich dark image and you move to the side and the image disappears and all the time yeah. you see yourself. So it's all about subjectivity and objectivity. Yeah. 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 And I, yeah. I also like the way Amazing. that you're, you're kind of, uh, and just as you can hold a photograph, you're kind of, um, anthropom I'm not saying you're anthropomorphizing, you know, making human the paper substrate, right? Which holds as well. And I think that's a really beautiful resonance. Like you're holding something, but the paper itself holds an image. And I think that's holding, really, it's holding the of, image uh, even after I'm gone. Yeah. Yeah. It's lovely. Yeah. Um, but Barbara, there's a there's a there's a question I think that really points. There's a number of comments and questions about this personal resonance, and there's a a great question for you, Eric, from Alice, um, mm -hmm. uh, who says greetings from Europe. Uh, she's and Alice says, I know the more personal it gets, the better the work. Uh, how do you manage and cope uh, with exposing your deepest emotions to an audience? Um, I think it's a really great great question uh, for for maybe any artist. But mm -hmm. uh, do you have any thoughts about that? Well, I think it's it's the nature of the job as an artist, right? That that that's part of if you if you're going to sign on to being an artist, uh, you have to be willing to share parts of yourself, whether it's through your art, through your photography, or through your words, or through your body, um, through your sculptures. That that uh, you have to be willing to find some truth within yourself. It doesn't mean it's all. This isn't an autobiographical piece. Uh, I, I will say, it, but it is. Um, but there are moments, there, there are, are a, a, a hundred truths to my experience within this storyline. And um, so being willing to share those and, 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 and to have the luxury as an artist to put a mask over it, that I don't have to tell you all about my, my deepest, darkest secrets, but I can explore some of those and wrestle with those myself and put a, a little distance between me and the audience is actually a gift of the art, I think. Um, and a requirement uh, of the art for to 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 love to to raise it up from just me telling you about myself to hopefully having something with greater resonance. But you're absolutely right that the more the more it connects on a personal level uh, and touches uh, as both an actor and as a, as an, a writer, um, I think the more hopefully the more potent it's going to be. Mm -hmm. I mean, it definitely feels that way as an audience member, having been an audience member <laughs> right, for, for your performance. Yeah. Um, Barbara, there's a question from Pam that I think uh, is, is, is uh, you could answer um, and really kind of I think allows you to expand a little bit about the show. Uh, she asks, the black and white photographs are beautiful or says the black and white photographs are beautiful, but asks, are all the photos and stories from storage black and white? Um, and um, how were the photos chosen for the exhibition? Like what was your, I guess, process in making the final selection of, as you said, 15, I believe? Yes. Well, we have about 7,000 photos. And I actually, every time I do a show from the collection, 
I tried to look through all of them on the computer. Um, but I was looking for things that really idealized and therefore I didn't want to have color. I wanted to leave it black and white. That said, there are many different kinds of black and white. There are some really warm tones. There's, um, you know, the Laura Gilpin Chichen Itza py pyramid is very warm, uh, partially because of the date, partially because of the aesthetic of the time, um, all the way to the, um, the works from the 90s by Friedlander, uh, for instance, which is very sort of cold and a, a, a more, much more neutral tone. But then there's the this, this sort of centerpiece, if you will, of the show is the Adam Pustigaretype, which has a kind of wonderful blue tonality and a depth, a mirror depth to it that is very otherworldly. So there's a real variety of, um, of affects and, and different images types. So they're all black and white with, within a, a sort of a broad range. Mm -hmm. That's great to hear that, you know, thought is sort of in some ways focusing on black and white makes you, makes the viewer maybe pay attention, become more attuned to these variety. That's, you know, the different processes and the different, as you said, tonalities. Um, uh, that's a really kind of uh, 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 great opportunity to sort of focus in that way. Um, there's a question, I think, Eric, that's perfect for you. Uh, or is actually addressed to you, I should say, <laughs> from Matt Weincombe from, it, it is perfect. Uh, from, Larry, from Larry Cleveland. Uh, Matt is fascinated by how some of the photos in, the, in this exhibit have been manipulated or staged uh, and the places idealized mm -hmm. by the photographer. So that, that was a you know, yeah. great sort of point I know that Barbara made. Um, Eric, is that something that you drawn, uh, drew on as you created a character who has a similar desire for control over his world and his life? Yeah, I think so. I think, um, yeah, it, it was a nice echo that, uh, again, as as Barbara said, she chose these pieces that were very carefully staged, you know, or not, I mean, st I mean, the, not all staged necessarily, but they were carefully taken. There was nothing on the fly, right? Nothing was just like quick snap. It was all very planned. And um, so I think you can't help but get that sense of calm from each of the photos, right? Because of that, there's no action, there's no um, urgency. There's no, what's going to happen next. I mean, all the pictures are very calming and, and just lovely and drawing you in to just be with that space and, and in, a, in a romantic kind of way. Um, so I think that that sense, yeah, that that, uh, tied into this sense of the character's need of control and of calm and of a little, a little, uh, peace, a little, um, corner in which the world looked nice, you know, that looked inviting, that looked, um, like it was going to be okay, that this was a beautiful world. Uh, and even if that requires some staging and fakeness to it, that we need that sometimes. And this character at this moment definitely did. Control. Um, Eric, Juliet asks, uh, and it also, uh, there's also, I think, uh, uh, something that you could respond to in here as well, uh, Barbara, did the scorched earth line come from the photographs, uh, Eric? Um, mm. I'm forgetting which image that was in reference to, uh, but I think I Juliet mentioned loved scorched earth before. early. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. Please. Yeah, I don't think it was uh, not. I I, I I will take full credit for that. Thank you, Juliet. I think that that's uh, absolutely what I intended. Um, however, uh, I did not until you just said that this moment uh, directly connect that. Um, it was. Uh, there's a little a little chicken and egg occurred just because I looked at the photos before I ever started writing. So, and I chose which photos I was gonna do. So obviously I chose, as you said, they're ones that were of a, a, a drier bent. Um, and, uh, and then as I started writing, the language just came out and I don't remember consciously thinking when I used the term scorched earth or any of that imagery of fire and burning and things, um, thinking that it would connect to the photos, but it all came out of having looked at really studied those photos. So um, I will totally credit my subconscious with that and say, you know, good job uh, and good job to you for noticing it. And now, as I say, from this moment on uh, this, I'm totally taking very conscious credit for that. So thank you. Um, and maybe I, I do want to, maybe we can take one more question. Um, Joanne um, Havala uh, asks, I'd like to know more about your storytelling process, Eric, and how, um, you know, how does he work to this wonderful outcome is, is her question. Thanks. Uh, it, it totally varies. It depends on the project. Um, 
in this case, I was approached by the museum uh, to see if I wanted to take part in this. And then I was given access to, again, all the pieces of the, the stories from storage exhibit. Um, so there's hundreds of pieces of art. And I just was able to look through all those. And literally, there were about like three dozen stories that came to mind based on the different pieces. And then um, whittled those down. And we agreed on, on this sequence of storytelling. Um, whenever, if the idea, so in this case, the idea came from the outside. Someone came to me and said, here's, here's a thing. Do you, do you want to tell a story about it? And that's one way that I write. Um, the other way is just generate self-generated. I mean, it always comes from outside. There's no, I don't create anything in my head. It's always, I see, I hear a neighbor talking or I watch my children playing or I do whatever the thing is. And then that starts sparking questions for me. And, uh, and I start writing, um, and sometimes it needs to gestate for a long time for me. Sometimes it can be uh, a while, uh, even years. Um, in this project, it was not because there was a timeline. But uh, uh, if, it's, if it's something no one has asked for, sometimes I'll get the seed of an idea and it'll take years before I start writing. And then once I start writing, and I always handwrite, I can't compose on a computer. I, 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 one of the few people I know who still has to handwrite, which is slower. Um, but once I start doing that, the actual writing is pretty quick and I tend to write scripts fairly fast because I just try to get them all out there and then start revising, um, which there was, yeah, just a modified version of that in this project, in this particular project. No, um, uh, thank you, Eric. Thank you. I mean, uh, thank you for doing mm -hmm. this. Um, I think, oh, sure. uh, for the sake of time, for sake of time, we're going to sort of wrap up and I want to thank all of you um, out there joining us. Uh, especially like to thank Eric and Barbara, who were the key to all of this. Thank you so much, both of you. Um, You're very welcome. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. And, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, and also some special thanks goes to Matt Wankham, who was in the chat earlier from Literary Cleveland, because he's been an excellent collaborator on, on this series and really sort of uh, very much like a co-creator. So um, so I want to also invite all of you out there to join uh, the next desktop dialogue in this same series on Wednesday, April 7th at noon. Um, again, the art anthology series accompanies the CMA exhibition Stories from Storage. And for this, for the second chapter on April 7th, food writer and culinary historian Sarah Lohman, who's the author of Eight Flavors, The Untold Story of American Cuisine, uh, is going to bring viewers uh, on a journey through the food, culture, and landscape of the Navajo Nation, beginning with the artist Lenore Tawney's postcard collage, uh, Canyon de Chez. Uh, which we saw a photograph of earlier today. So it'll be a really nice connection. Uh, in creating uh, her narrative, Loman draws on curator Emily Peters' research into Tawny's artistic practice, and also on interdis interdisciplinary artist Zephyrin Anderson's deep knowledge of Diné, weaving, and history. So it'll be a really great um, sort of amalgamation of, of ideas and mind. We're really excited about this. Uh, so to find out more about this upcoming program and other ones, uh, just visit cma.org. Um, if you would like to explore more of the works in our collection and the objects and stories from storage, just visit uh, CMA's collection online. There's a link for that below. Uh, and if we didn't get to your question, there were some wonderful comments and questions, but there's something you are burning to have answered. Um, you can always go to Artlens Ask on our CMA website and someone will get back to you with an answer and the link for that is below. So thanks again, everyone for joining us uh, and have a great afternoon. Stay well. <laughs>